Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. This program is sponsored in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support the arts and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Scott Laborde, and welcome to Stepping Out with the latest news on the restaurant arts and entertainment scene. We are teleconferencing from various locations in New Orleans, and we have with us Poppy Tooker and Ian McNulty. A little later, we'll have Alan Smason and a very special feature about the restaurant scene. But first up, Poppy, I guess takeout's the only way to go for many New Orleans restaurants. Yes, takeout is the only way to go for New Orleans restaurants right now for those who have chosen to do it. And a lot have stuck their toe in the water and then decided takeout wasn't for them, like Commander's Palace, for instance. But very interestingly, Rouse's has jumped into this scene and they're selling takeout food from some of our favorite restaurants like turtle soup from Commander's and hummus from Saba. Susan Spicer was in the kitchen at Rosedale when I talked to her the other day, cooking up some delicious things herself that were going to Rouse's. And this week, Galatoise has now jumped on board with their shrimp remoulade. So goodness knows what you can get at Rouse's these days. But Toops are the crew at Toops. I have incredible admiration for Isaac and Amanda. Before this terrible stuff really got rolling. They had already reached out to their friends in the hospitality community, letting everybody know that they were welcome to join in their staff meal that happens every day at three o'clock. Well, it just blossomed and it bloomed. And seven days a week at three o'clock, they're over there feeding anybody who's hungry, in particular, the folks with the hospitality industry. And Amanda herself told me a story about some folks from the Ritz Carlton with little kids in the back seat. And it just was really too close to home for her with their own two little children. So they desperately need support. They've been getting donations and you can Venmo them at Toops Meadery. You can send them some money via PayPal and dinner is going to continue being available for takeout and pickup at four o'clock, seven days a week. But they've discontinued their lunch service because they're feeding hundreds of people now every day at three o'clock. Poppy, we're gonna come right back to you, but Ian, what about the bar situation these days? Well, Peggy, uh, if the restaurants are down to takeout only, the bars are just down. Uh, all the bars were closed across the state of Louisiana, and that means um, there is really zero option for them to serve their guests and to keep anybody working at all. So all bar staff is, is out of work. Uh, unfortunately, in the very much the same boat as a lot of restaurant and hotel staff. But leave it to New Orleans, people have been getting pretty creative about keeping in touch with each other and even supporting uh, their favorite bars and bartenders. Now let's remember, okay, this is New Orleans, right? We're, we're a restaurant town, we're a hospitality town, we're a social town. Bars, those little corner joints, those special places you go to across town, they have this role in our lives, right? I mean, it, they're part of the social fabric of New Orleans. And one way that people have been reconnecting with them is online. Uh, Daniel Victory, he runs Victory, uh, Victory Bar down on Barone Street in the CBD. He and his business partner have been pretty creative. They've been hosting a happy hour where it's just Daniel behind the bar mixing cocktails. Uh, while Camille Whitworth, Whitworth, his business partner, tapes it on, a, on camera, and they distribute this off with a DJ playing at a remote location, much like we're doing here. It's part cocktail class, part social time, uh, really creative. And of course, you know, you're encouraged to tip, tip, tip <laughs> from the apps, and that goes to their staff. 
Others around town doing a similar thing. I talked to the folks at the Milan Lounge, that great uptown place there uh, on the street that nobody pronounces <laughs> Milan, anywhere in New Orleans. Milan, Milan to Milan in New Orleans. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, and regulars are missing each other. They're missing their favorite bartenders. So they're getting in touch on a Facebook group and, you know, chatting with one another, teasing each other, just doing the stuff you normally do at a bar. Finn McCool's Irish Pub in Mid City has probably taken it to the to the highest level. Uh, you know, it's a pub, it's an Irish pub, it's a community center for the people who are regulars there. I've been known to darken the door a time or two, I'll admit. Uh, they started a group on Facebook where you see regulars doing all the things that they would be doing if they were at the bar. They're posting pictures from the past as if they're telling old stories about hijinks and highlights that they've had before. They're teasing each other. But most importantly, they're supporting the bartenders by sending them tips online through a uh, Venmo account, through um, different ways that the bars have to connect with folks. And you know, they're, they're in a way, when they're having a drink at home, they're giving a tip to their bartenders. And anybody can do this. Any bar that you can think, think of, they probably have a bartender with uh, their Venmo number available. A lot of uh, these virtual tip jar sites have come up. Look up virtual tip jar or New Orleans bartender tip party, and you can find the bartenders at a lot of your favorite bars and lounges around town. When you're sitting back having a drink at home, you can throw them a dollar or two or 20 or whatever you're feeling. Yeah. And you just recently did a story. So that story would be at um, the Times Picayune and New Orleans Advocate, too, Nola. for uh, more That's details. Right. Huh? And NOLA.com, of course, too. Poppy, back to you about fish fries. We, we've yeah. still got them. That's a real New Orleans tradition, but it's really helping folks extra this, these days. Huh? You just can't stop those Lenten Friday fish fries. And this all started three weeks ago or so. Craig Borges, who his business is the New Orleans Seafood Company, and and Drew Knoll, his partner, they had all this fish and they had nothing to do with it. And so they actually reached out to other restaurateurs. And so most recently, Station 6, Pesh, Luke, um, they have all been offering $15 grilled or fried with a side Ralph's on the park. And by the way, they're also running an incredible deal, 75% off bottles of wine. I mean, that's mm. an incredible deal. And the most incredible, this is New Orleans, you know? So of course, Monsignor Nalti is going from location to location, blessing the whole affair. And so, you know, you got the blessing, you're safe to go get the fish fry. And I hope everybody will. This will continue through next Friday for sure. And I heard that Galatoire's and Ralph's on the Park for next Friday, Good Friday are definitely in. And now let's look at the way some of New Orleans' top chefs are coping with the coronavirus crisis. Before all of this started, I was the executive chef of Belle Epoque on Bourbon and Bienville in the French Quarter. It was weird. Friday was fine. I mean, we were hearing about things starting to happen. Saturday was the day they closed us at 9 p.m. and then they, they tried to clear the French Quarter. Sunday was when it was really thin and you could tell it, things were changing, you know. And we got the word, I think, by like three that we were gonna have to close very early. You know, I think I realized it affected my business a little too late. I mean, I'm sure everybody did. Um, really, I just realized how severe it'd be about five or six days before we actually closed down. Um, you know, things went from zero to 100 fairly quickly. Our sales dropped, you know, 70 to 80 percent on the first, second day. I mean, by that, by sat Friday, probably dropped about 90 percent which is extremely severe. I wasn't sure if we're gonna close, um, you know, until about 24 hours before we did. Yesterday, um, we really shut everything down. The thing that pains you the most are the men and women that I work with every day. And to go through this, it happened fast, but the fact that we furloughed or, you know, people are laid off, I've never done that in my life. It pains me that I said goodbye to all these people because it's hard for us to stay connected. We all need to quarantine or whatever, but we are stronger together than not. So we're gonna stick together. 
This has been one of the hardest weeks that Emily and I have ever had in our entire lives. Uh, last Monday, you know, we had we people weren't allowed to come into restaurants anymore, and we had to unfortunately, uh, you know, put a, several of our most of our team members on furlough, and. Uh, really quickly we just kind of geared up to begin doing takeout and delivery. Starting tomorrow we're, we're going to be feeding uh, doctors and nurses and, and, and emergency rooms with Ashner because we're all going through the same emotions but we also know that in times like this people need food and this is what we do and uh, yeah. that I think for Emily and I brings us a sense of accomplishment in the middle of in the middle of all of this that we can actually do something that makes people feel good. My wife who's an ER doctor would come home from work and tell me about work and one day she said um, a nurse had brought cookies to share for everybody in the ER that night and it was like a game changer morale booster for them the idea hit me, oh, I know a bunch of restaurant owners, and I know that they're struggling, and I know the hospital workers need really good food to boost their morale light right now, so let's just connect the dot. And I placed a $60 order of food, sent a little email to my crew members, and put it on Instagram, and asked for donations so that we could order more food. And um, the first day, $500 came in from my crew members. Um, the second day, $1,500 came in. The third day, it was $3,000. So yesterday, we made about 30 deliveries to 14 different locations in New Orleans, which is covering almost every ER and ICU. You know, in times like this, I think it's incumbent upon ourselves to do whatever we can. Special thanks to Jonathan Evans, Marion Gay, and Stephen Patrickman for that report. And now it's time to visit with Alan Smason. Alan? Well, Peggy, we are back again reporting on what's going on in theater, which is not a lot, but uh, we are letting everybody know that we did talk to David Skinner, who is the general manager of the Sanger. Now, the Sanger, of course, has closed down shop for the foreseeable future. I did want to ask him a couple of questions though, specifically about what's going on, not only with the Sanger season, but also with the Hard Rock Hotel demolition, which has been again in the news. So first off, of course, because of the direction from the uh, governor, uh, no gatherings of 250 people or more are allowed. Uh, the Sanger productions are postponed uh, for the foreseeable future. At the time right now that they are working, they're trying to reschedule several of these uh, national tours and also, of course, uh, they're going to let people know via social media, also emails and websites. They'll contact anybody who's a subscriber directly. But uh, they will be monitoring the situation. Hopefully, the Sanger, uh, which is which, uh, our glorious uh, theater here in New Orleans, which is, again, larger than any Broadway theater, uh, is going to hopefully be open soon. We don't know when, but we hope soon. Now, as far as the demolition of the Hard Rock, uh, they said they're not part of that decision process. Uh, David said that... Uh, 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 Sanger, of course, has been an icon, uh, a staple of the city since 1927, and uh, again, been through so much uh, being uh, restored, and of course, after Katrina, uh, you know, having a, a, a big uh, restoration project that uh, saw it finally opening again. Um, as he said, the Sanger will always be a part of New Orleans, and like all New Orleanians, would like to see it back as soon as possible, but they have no way of saying right now what the impact of the demolition will be on their future uh, business. And, and basically their model as far as right now is just closed. Now, as far as um, theater in New Orleans, yes, the uh, brick and mortar places are closed, but that does not mean the internet is not open to all of our theater folk. Uh, they have a group 
called No Pants Shakespeare, and I believe that Augustin Carrero of the Tennessee Williams Theater Festival is credited with the title. But they have a, a bunch of people who are performing, and as a matter of fact, they're performing uh, at the time that we're broadcasting this for the first time uh, opposite us, but they're going to be rebroadcasting it. So I want everybody to pay attention. Go to YouTube and look up No Pants Shakespeare if you missed the Friday evening broadcast. This is going to be starring uh, Big Easy Award winners uh, James Bartell, Trina Beck, James Yergin, Keith Clavery, Leslie Clavery, and a, a number of other people, 13 cast people, doing a Zoom in which they all will be partaking in Shakespeare's As You Like It. And I like that a lot. I think it's wonderful that they're, they're being so creative in... Uh, uh, what would normally be a, a very uh, depressing kind of situation. So they're moving onward and upward and involving people and, again, getting other people who are interested in theater to tune in to them on YouTube. Again, that's No Pants Shakespeare. Now, speaking of the Big Easy Awards, they were supposed to have their big celebration coming up uh, this week at the Higgins Hotel. Uh, those of you who uh, were planning on going, of course, know it's been postponed. They're going to try to do it again later in the summer. But I, I will tell you that for the first time, the Big Easy Awards were going to be uh, dealing with all the music, the classical arts, the theater, uh, as well as dance. It was going to be a, a whole new kind of model for the Big Easy Awards. They're still planning on doing that and hopefully going to be still doing it at the Higgins Hotel. But uh, for right now, I did, you know, did want to say that, that uh, this is going to be a whole new format and it's going to be more of a friendly kind of a concert uh, kind of atmosphere rather than the long award show like an Academy Awards presentation that we've seen in the past. Now, how to spend your time, you know, with the kids, with the spouse, you know, uh, what are we going to do to keep busy if you love theater and you can't go out to see the theater? Well, one of the things I really want to uh, talk about is Broadway HD. This uh, is a pay-per-view kind of situation. They actually ask you to pay by the month. Uh, or by the year. I believe it's a, about $9 uh, a month or around $100 for a year subscription. But they have a compendium of works. Uh, unbelievable. They've got uh, uh, almost 70 different Broadway musicals. Uh, they've got a host of things like Shakespeare. And it's unlimited in terms of, of what you can see. Now, last week, I was able to see Oklahoma with Hugh Jackman in all its glory for free. So keep in mind to go back and forth, even if you're not subscribing to Broadway HD, uh, you can see some free shows sometimes, even if you're not a subscriber. But keep in mind, they do give a one-week subscription for free. You can test drive it. Check it out. BroadwayHD.com. I think you're going to enjoy all that they have there. They've got some wonderful historic films as well as some incredible shows. Bette Midler's Gypsy, uh, the original cast of Sweeney Todd with uh, Angela Lansbury. Uh, you will uh, be very interested to see what they have on store for you as well. So that's pretty much all we have right now to talk about because, uh, again, uh, the theaters are shuttered. But uh, as of right now, you know, we're keeping, uh, you know, our eyes open and our ears glued to find out what's going on in the world. We do appreciate uh, your being patient with us, and we're going to continue to keep giving you the information you need. That's it for now. And now for our nostalgic New Orleans vignette, Paul Prudhomme. Louisiana legend. Cajun sensation chef Paul Prudhomme helped ignite a revolution in American gastronomy in the 1980s when he introduced the regional cuisine of Louisiana to the world. Born in 1940 to Eli and Hazel Prudhomme in Opelousas, Louisiana, Paul was the youngest of the tenant farmer's 13 children and, from a young age, help prepare family meals on a wood fire stove. As a young man, Paul headed west and worked in a variety of commercial kitchens for 12 years before returning to Louisiana. In 1975, he was hired as the first American-born chef of Commander's Palace, the venerable Garden District restaurant owned by Ella Brennan and her family. Out of the push and pull between Cajun cooking and the refined Creole cuisine of Commanders, magic was made. Chef Paul opened K. Paul's Louisiana Kitchen in 1979 with Kay Hendricks, his future wife. This French Quarter establishment became one of the hottest restaurants in the nation. Diners stood in line to sample the intricately seasoned dishes at the funky culinary mecca. During his career, the ambassador of Cajun cuisine fed heads of state, 
launched a popular line of seasoning blends and starred in five national public television cooking series taped at WYES-TV in New Orleans. Named a pioneer of American cuisine by the Culinary Institute of America, Chef Paul remained a trailblazer throughout his life. New Orleans bid farewell to the culinary legend following his passing on October 8, 2015, paying tribute to the chef from humble roots who redefined American cuisine. And now time for our picks of the week. First up, Poppy. Looking to get some fresh food in the house? The Crescent City Farmer's Market is offering a $40 produce box delivered right to your door. Different treats, they're doing it twice a week. Just go to crescentcityfarmersmarket.com to find out more about it. And don't miss Louisiana Eats continuing COVID-19 coverage every weekend. All right, and next for you, Ian. Poppy, check out feedthefrontline.org. This is a new program, grassroots, from the founder of the crew of Red Beans, one of the wonderful carnival marching groups. Here's what they're doing. They're feeding frontline healthcare workers in the hospitals, the doctors and nurses, and at the same time, supporting restaurants. They're spending thousands of dollars a day at these restaurants, really helping some of them keep their kitchens running, keeping a few people employed, at the same time, feeding these doctors and nurses and actually employing local musicians to deliver the food. So it's a fantastic program. They're spending a lot of money at these local restaurants, feeding a lot of people. They need your help. Feedthefrontline.org. Thank you both so very much. And my pick is 73 Distillery is making hand sanitizer and offering a free four ounce bottle with the purchase of a bottle of spirits. They're located at 301 North Claiborne Avenue. That's right there at Bienville, 73 distillingcom They're also uh, selling the sanitizer um, actually from uh, Britannia Liquor and Langensteins, as well as from the distillery itself, part of the proceeds go to help unemployed service industry workers. And now it's time to hear Alan Spason's Pick of the Week. So for my pick, Peggy, I'd like to let everybody know that the National Yiddish Folkspiel Theater is having some wonderful shows. Basically, uh, they are broadcasting uh, via Zoom. Uh, Yesterday, they had a great cast assembling of The Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish with Joel Gray, the director, all there in his glory. So I want to remind you, if you get a chance, uh, nytf.org, uh, that's for the National Yiddish Theater, folksbeing.org uh, website to go check that out as well. In addition to our broadcast, you can watch us also at WYES.org and at WYES On Demand on our YouTube channel. Poppy and Ian, thank you so very much. <laughs> thank you, Alan, and thank you all very much for watching. Goodbye. Thanks for keeping us going, Peg. We love it. Thank you. This program is sponsored in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support the arts and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. To commemorate the founding of New Orleans in 1718, WYES presents this tricentennial moment in celebration of our city's past and present. 
In this digital age, with hundreds of television channels and viewing options, it's hard to imagine New Orleans with only one TV station. But when WDSU signed on the air on December 18, 1948, it was the city's first station, and for nearly a decade, it was the only one in town. Channel 6 was founded by Edgar Stern and his family, whose personal wealth built the station into a powerhouse. Its first studios were in the Hibernia Bank Building, before moving to the French Quarter in 1950. In those early days, programming was sparse. The test pattern was a popular sight. Most of the station's early personalities were radio veterans, including Terry Fletridge, best known as Mrs. Muffin, and as host of The Midday Show. Hi, everybody. Top of the evening to you. Here's Mel one. Levitt was another favorite as a sports reporter, carnival commentator, and more. Good evening, everyone. This is Alec Gifford reporting. Newsman Alec Gifford and meteorologist Nash Roberts both started at six and spent more than 50 years in local television. Actor Dick Van Dyke even hosted his own show on Channel 6 in the 1950s. WWL signed on in September 1957. Owned by Loyola University, it built on the success of WWL Radio, the city's first radio station. Popeye and Pals was an early favorite. Elvis Presley and Rubberneckin'. Followed in the 1960s by a Saturday afternoon dance show hosted by John Peeler. Channel 4 stocked its newsroom with big name talent, including sports director Hap Glaudy. Good evening. And editorialist Phil Johnson. As news director in the 1970s, Johnson would hire many of the station's icons, including Garland Robinette and Angela Hill, co-anchors who were later a married couple. Channel 4 also gave us Dr. Momus Alexander Morgus, whose magnificent science experiments appeared in between segments of horror movies. WVUE-TV signed on in 1953 as WJMR-TV. Its channel number moved all over the dial before settling on Channel 8. Its newsroom was a training ground for many well-known journalists, and its sports director, Buddy Deliberto, would become a local legend. WYS also plays a role in local television history. The station signed on April 1, 1957, fulfilling the dream of a group of community activists inspired by the power of television as an educational tool. That mission continues as WYS documents local history and informs viewers about the past, present, and future of this city and region. WYS's New Orleans Tricentennial Moments are brought to you by the Miro Foundation and presented in association with the historic New Orleans Collection.